CTV's W5, a voyage of discovery through Canada's north. It's beautiful. I've never seen anything like this. To experience the beauty of nature. It's hard not to be blown away by an environment like this. The roots of our most northern people. It's really magical. And our delicate ecosystem under threat. Traffic will happen. Mining at business will happen here. As the climate warms and the world's attention turns to Canada's north, W5 travels the fabled Northwest Passage. We've got the longest coastline on the planet. For some, a voyage home. We have to struggle to get our history acknowledged. For others, an awakening. The Arctic is changing in so many ways, socially, economically, and of course, environmentally. But for all, a lesson in our history. I love Canada. Canada is a good country but a lot of improvements can be done. And the ties that bind the country. What better way to connect Canada? Here is Kevin Newman. Hello, thanks for joining us. Connecting Canada's north to the more populated south has always been a technical and cultural challenge, but it's becoming much more urgent now that there are multiple countries jockeying for position in the Arctic. So to help build that connection, a retired Coast Guard vessel has been on an incredible journey from Toronto to Victoria through the Northwest Passage, all the while digitally connected for the first time to a worldwide audience. W5 was on board for the most spectacular part of that adventure. And Omar Sachadina is our guide to the people, the challenges, and the breathtaking beauty of the passage. These pristine waters are part of the longest coastline in the world. And now, a first of its kind digitally connected icebreaker will sail it. <laughs> From Toronto to Charlottetown to Victoria, this expedition will traverse every part of Canada's three coasts over 150 days, taking a total of 350 Canadians from all walks of life along for the ride. This ambitious voyage is called Canada C3. It's the brainchild of explorer Jeff Green, a member of the Order of Canada. Canada C3 is born with a very simple premise that we got the longest coastline on the planet of any country. And what better way to connect Canada for Canada 150 than to sail from the Great Lakes to the Atlantic coast through the Arctic, our longest coastline, and then over the Pacific and use that journey to connect Canadians. Green hopes to spread a message of Arctic conservation. He has visited the area more than 50 times over the past two decades. The science is in, you know, it's indisputable. We have seen lots of changes here, for sure, uh, with the naked eye. A lot of that is, is about ice, diminishing sea ice. But these are all things that you've experienced yourself firsthand. I, we took National Park, which means the place that never melts, is melting so much that uh, they've had to close the park a couple of times due to flash floods. This leg will see the vanishing Arctic up close. First stop, Croker Bay, to visit a glacier that is disappearing by the second. It's a glacier that's in retreat, it's getting thinner, uh, it's slowly dying, basically, but it is absolutely beautiful. Everywhere, a sense of wonder, glittering ice under a sun that never sets. It's beautiful. I've never seen anything like this, or ma even imagined that this could possibly exist. Student and inventor Anne Makasinski is one of 26 participants who will travel from Pond Inlet to Cambridge Bay, Nunavut, over the next 13 days. W5 is there for this defining leg, sailing into the high Arctic with a course straight through the Northwest Passage. The group includes artists, educators, students, and writers, but the largest cohort is the scientists. 
They are studying the warming climate and melting sea ice that make this journey possible, taking samples of plants and wildlife right around the country. This is a colony of 100,000 or more breeding pairs of thick-billed murres. Those are the black and white ones that kind of look like penguins. There's also 30,000 or so pairs of northern fulmars and black-legged kittiwakes. Arctic ecologist Paul Smith has visited this area for decades, but is still in awe. He has seen the diet of the birds he studies shift dramatically in the last decade. It's hard not to be blown away by an environment like this. And so this is one of the first places where I was really captivated by the Arctic. And this, you know, this might have had an influence on setting me on this trajectory to, be a, to devote my career to, to studying Arctic wildlife. How many birds live here? Well, there's about 350,000 birds in, in total that live here. You know, there's three species that, that dominate on these cliffs here. Uh, and we'll probably get a chance to have a look at them closer once we pull up to the colony. And I saw one that sort of looked like a, a penguin. Yeah, Which that's right. That? That's the thick-billed myrrh. So the thick-billed myrrh is kind of like the northern answer to the penguin. There's the, just the sound of birds, this cacophony. You know, there's birds flying over your head. There's birds flying off the cliffs. It's just incredible. You can hear it now. Yeah. Yeah. The ship itself is a floating lab. All of our specimens and our researchers uh, use them to establish baselines of what's normal for biodiversity in Canada. Chief Scientist Mark Graham. What we're looking at, is, what people on this voyage are really interested in are those bigger things, birds and mammals. So they're spectacular and we're seeing lots of them. Are there homes under threat? Is climate change destroying these creatures' habitats? There's a lot of uh, migratory birds, for example, which are dependent on the movements of ice or the extent of ice uh, and all of the kinds of food that emerge in the ocean when the ice is, is cracking and moving around. Uh, and so if, if climate is altering those kinds of conditions, then um, all of those animals will have to adapt to those things. And if they don't adapt? And if they don't adapt, uh, they, they move away, they, they find another way or they perish. The polar bear is one species that is being closely monitored as it adapts to the warming Arctic. They're quite deep over here. This area in Sermalik National Park is completely melted and muddy. At least one polar bear has been through it recently. Expedition guide Alex Taylor. So you can see the imprints of the rear paw and the front. And I've seen as I've been walking around here on a huge number of tracks. And there are tracks down by the beach. Got a bedding site over here. Well, it's really nice to see this because what I think of is the same as an archaeological site. Behind every track or every bone, there's a story. Wildlife is only part of the story in this vast landscape. Canada's north is home to more than 100,000 people. A stop on day three is a homecoming of sorts for two Canada C3 participants. Okay. Jenna Merkisak, a nursing student from Pond Inlet, Nunavut, and retired British Columbia judge Tom Smith, have never met. But they share a special connection to one particular place. So we're on Devon Island, a place, uh, area called Dundas Harbor. This place is very significant to me because my grandmother was born here. Dundas Harbor was abandoned in the 1950s. Do I jump? All right. Today, it's a ghost town. But it was once an RCMP detachment. In 1924, nine Inuit families were temporarily relocated to populate the area. Jenna's great-grandparents were among them, and her grandmother was born here. I can't think right now. I'm, I, I'm feeling it. Like, I just feel so grateful to be here. To go here, knowing where my grandmother was born, is, it is really, it's really magical. Ooh, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. <laughs> like Jenna, Tom has never been to Dundas Harbor before, but he's also retracing steps. Tom worked in the Arctic as an RCMP officer 55 years ago. In 1962, on the 9th of August, 
I uh, went by ice, icebreaker to Alexandra Fjord, the most northerly detachment the RCMP had. It was probably the most isolated place in the world. I traveled to Devon Island, which Dundas Harbor is located on, by dog team a number of times. But to get here by dog team, you have to go over uh, a glacier with crevasses. So I've always longed to come here. And it gives me a similar feeling to when I arrived at Alexander Fjord. Here we are. And these buildings are still here. It's incredible. It's hard because all I, all I can think about are Inuktitut words, and some of them can't really be translated to English. So I feel tongue-tied, and <laughs> it's, it's, it's a good feeling. And there's really no words to it. A newly opened route through the north brings travelers from far and wide. Why is this part of the journey so critical? This is the heart of the passing. When W5 continues. The Northwest Passage. It is the defining feature of Canada's Arctic Ocean and its most storied the place that eluded Sir John Franklin's expedition in 1845. Three, four, three, under gyro. Three, four, three. The Canada C-3 ship is on a course to retrace Franklin's route, but conditions have changed suddenly. Give me a minute, Kevin. I'm stopping the ship again. Roger that. I'll just snug her into the side of the ship. Captain Stéphane Guy, a 19-year veteran of the Coast Guard, knows how dangerous this area can be. The westerly wind has started earlier than expected, so the ice moved in. Whenever there is ice in this passage, it's narrow, and currents here are known to be very strong. In terms of navigation, this is very serious current. So what's going through your mind right now? Maybe one higher level of planning with regards to the transit. The ice was supposed to be uh, about 10 nautical miles away from this western entrance of Bellot Strait. Right now, we, it, the ice is just there. The passage is only two kilometers wide, making getting trapped in the ice a real possibility. Bellot Strait is 25 kilometers long, and it could take this vessel an hour of ice breaking per kilometer to push through it. In clear water conditions, the ship would be able to sail the entire strait in one hour. Why is this part of the journey so critical? This area is typically the very difficult area. Over the past 200 years, we've been sailing these areas, even three, 400 years. And this is the heart of the passage, really. Many, many missions have failed because of ice conditions over there. And this is typically where Sir John Franklin and his team uh, started to face serious trouble. The Polar Prince's reinforced hull is something the Franklin ships, the Erebus and the Terror, didn't have when they became iced in here, virtually frozen in time. Today, the C3 vessel isn't the only boat attempting the passage. A sailboat up here, Captain. A sailboat? Yeah. Yeah, I see that. In fact, two sailboats with European families are tailing the Polar Prince. Oh, look at that big splash! Down on the bow, participants marvel at the ice and that anyone would try to sail here. While climate change has caused significant melting in the Northwest Passage, the area can still freeze over. Canadian ice service scientist Tom Zagon has experience on these waters. We saw a sailboat today. Yeah. Who does that? Who takes a sailboat out in the, in the Northwest Passage? Well, I'm, I'm sure they're not interacting with any ice flows in, in, in any way, but they're small enough to be able to, to, to avoid even the, 
the small pieces of ice. And I'm sure they looked at the weather forecast and they looked at the ice conditions. There was a, there's still a lead here and then they made their way to, uh, to Bella Strait because if they had waited, they might be waiting for another five, five, six days. That's glad to be another example of the changing climate that, that a vessel like a sailboat is able to attempt this that, passage. That's true. In the last uh, 10, 15 years, you see adventurers, so sailboats, um, some other strange craft, but obviously cruise ships as well. They actually make the passage because conditions allow it. Natural wonders are only part of the C3 journey. The ship visits communities on land almost every day. But on one day, the view from on board was almost as exciting as the land when the vessel sailed past a polar bear. Canadians outside the ship get a glimpse of the bear in real-time social media posts, thanks to ship-wide Wi-Fi, a first on an expedition through the Northwest Passage. There were, of course, no satellite connections in 1845, when Sir John Franklin set out to map the passage. Though Inuit had navigated the area for thousands of years, for European explorers of the day, finding the Northwest Passage a coveted trade shortcut from Western Europe to Asia was the ultimate goal. The C3 retraces Franklin's ill-fated route. We're on Beachy Island, where Sir John Franklin and his crew took shelter in the winter of 1845-46 on their expedition to map the final 500 kilometers of the Northwest Passage. But they never completed their journey, and some of Franklin's men are buried here. The Franklin expedition set sail from England in 1845 with 129 crew on board. They were never seen again by Europeans. The graves of three of Franklin's men mark the winter the crew spent here after abandoning their ice-bound ships Terror and Erebus. The sinking of the Franklin ships launched dozens of search expeditions that went on for years. Supplies were left in case Franklin and his boys were wandering around lost and needed food and clothing. Search parties left supplies and built Northumberland House in hopes the remaining Franklin crew would find them. Participants Jenna, Jayputi, and Aviak have their own recollections of the Franklin story. <laughs> But what really happened is um, they suffered from lead poisoning yep. and they ate their own men. Yep. But they blamed the Inuit. Cannibalism. Yeah, yeah, that's what they did. Inuit oral history contains stories of encountering Franklin's starving crew who refused help from locals, resorting to cannibalism over the seal meat that Inuit offered them. Modern analysis of crew members' bones confirmed those early accounts. It took years for word of the tragedy to reach Europe. In today's online world, news of that magnitude travels within seconds. But parts of Canada's north are not as connected as the rest of the country. Improving internet access is at the core of participant Jeff Phillips' mission. He's the founder and CEO of SSI Micro, the North's largest internet service provider. C3 approached his team to make the seemingly impossible possible. To put a dish on the ground and drive three big steel piles 30 feet down and hold that thing fixed to the ground to point at a satellite 33,000 kilometers away is one challenge. But to put it on a boat where the boat is constantly moving and rocking and that dish has to correct for that, uh, it's never been done before to have broadband connectivity on a ship through the Northwest Passage. We worked with another firm and uh, put the big bubble up top that you'll see, and inside that is a, is a satellite dish that's constantly moving. So the bubble is a... Um, it's a weather sat- shield uh, okay. to cover the dish and okay. the electronics inside. And it has to keep that perfectly aligned because every two degrees there's a different satellite. Jeff grew up in a town of 800 people in the Northwest Territories and saw firsthand the impacts of isolation. 
I just wanted to improve the community. I wanted to bring those services that were available outside into our community. It's very difficult to get educators to move north to a small community. And when you lose a good educator, it impacts so many kids in that community. So for me, it's, um, it's very emotional because it's, it's something we can fix. And we're just not doing a great job. It's tough for you to talk about. Yeah. Why does it hit so close to home? because it's solvable. And um, it's difficult to stand by and watch as this problem gets worse. We've got better internet on this ship than the people do out there. What does well, that say to you? We do have, there is inequality there for sure. Um, so. There is definitely some irony in the fact that we have great connectivity on board this ship. Um, better than any consumer has in a community. These, these satellite connections are the roads for a lot of people in the north and we just aren't getting the level of support that we need to build better roads. Up on the bridge, the crew depends on satellite and maps to steer the ship through the passage. The Polar Prince has been pushing through the icy water for hours. But the biggest challenge lies ahead. The forgotten history of the North. There's a lot we don't know about Canada. And the slow journey to forgiveness. That really started the healing process. When W5 continues. Welcome back. Well, as the incredible connected voyage of the Canada C3 sails on, Omar Sachedina continues to explore the past and future of Canada's northern population. And W5 also discovers just how common it's become to attempt the trip through the once impenetrable Northwest Passage. Over the course of an extraordinary 150-day expedition, this ship the Canada C3 Polar Prince has passed Canada's major ports, witnessed its natural wonders, and hosted leaders from every sphere of Canadian life as it sails our country's entire coastline, the longest in the world. And now, at the halfway point, it has finally cleared the Northwest Passage. The vessel has been breaking through ice for over 20 hours. We're on two engine, full ahead. You have the con. I have the con. On the bridge, Captain Stefan Guy surveys the path ahead. These don't even look like the same waters as before. No, definitely. The contrast with yesterday is big and feels very good. You must be breathing a sigh of relief today. Yeah, I do, I do. We've passed through the ice, as have the sailboats we encountered. A reminder that more vessels are now navigating this region. When we hear about climate change and that opening up this passageway and that increasing traffic, what do we need to be conscious of? I'm aware that uh, these passages are challenged by all countries around the world as being international waterways. And this is the difficulty uh, Canada has. Apart from establishing strongly its ownership of the Canadian Arctic, because this is disputed in some parts of it, the main waterways are challenged. And that's my biggest concern for the Arctic, because traffic will happen, mining business will happen here. And Iqaluit will grow, Pound Inlet will grow, Resolute will grow. They will become, in 50 years, much bigger cities than they are today. Resolute Bay is where the C3 stops next. It's the second most northerly settlement in Canada with a population of about 250. It has a dark history. The people of Resolute Bay are originally from Inukjuak, northern Quebec and Pond Inlet, Nunavut. Beginning in 1953, they were expelled from their homes and forced to resettle here. 
2,000 kilometers north. It was part of a government strategy to strengthen Canada's claim on the Arctic. She can tell you a short story of the relocation. Acting Mayor Susan Salubinik was a baby when her family was relocated from Pond Inlet. So welcome everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Her husband, Ali, was four years old. Most of the original that were relocated up here either moved back to northern Quebec or Pond Inlet. You know, there was a time when our community was so angry. A relocation, I feel, was not done right. They did not have houses waiting for them. When they were relocated here, there was no food provided for them. This was a totally different environment. Ali takes us to Resolute Bay's long abandoned army outpost. It was a military base when we were relocated up here. I can't remember the number of the military personnel, but there were a few of them back in 1953. As a kid, did you ever remember feeling used? that you were being sent so far up north so Canada could stake a claim to this territory? Uh, when I was a, a kid, I never thought about it. We eventually found out that we had been used. We were human flagpoles for the Canadian High Arctic Islands. We called ourselves the exiles in our own country. I love Canada, like I said, but this, this was not right the way it was done. Um, they promised us many things. Promised us that if we want to go back home in two years, we'd be able to go home. But uh, that, that promise was not kept either by the federal government. Then Minister of Aboriginal Affairs, John Duncan, apologized for the relocation in 2010. He said, uh, on behalf of Canada, on behalf of the government of Canada, we <clears throat> we sincerely apologize and there were lots of tears but but uh, that, <clears throat> that really started the healing process it took more than half a century. It took more than half a century. <clears throat> and the people that really deserved the apology were no longer with us like our parents. I'm very proud to be a Canadian. Um, I love Canada. Canada is a good country, but a lot of improvements can be done. Repairing the relationship between settlers and Canada's indigenous peoples is one of the C3 Expedition's goals. Founder Jeff Green hopes that participants will help spread this message. I hope that these Canadians that are coming on to Canada C3 will leave with a much better understanding of, of our country, of its past, uh, certainly of its present, but also with a lot of ideas for the future. But there's a lot we don't know about Canada. If you're an indigenous person, in many cases, the last 150 years has been all downhill. There's been some really ignorant and, 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 and painful uh, decisions made. And one thing C3 has become is a real a journey of reconciliation that's that's um, giving a platform for those stories to be heard and shared and so where does that come from well what? from real human stories and um, really really painful and horrendous stories quite frankly is there a story that sticks out for you though is there is there one where you saw that you just i mean you couldn't even sit through it it was that difficult to listen to the residential school survivor stories, I mean, maybe the, the best one to share is one that Canadians have learned about, and that's Chani Wenjack. And on the ship, we have the Gord Downey Chani Wenjack legacy room. And Chani was a boy that tried running away from residential school and died on that journey, trying to get home to his family. Um, and unfortunately, his story's one of 
hundreds and hundreds. And the scars are so deep. And the thing about all of this, of course, is it's intergenerational. It's being passed down. The Gore Downey Chani Wenjack Fund legacy room on board the ship was purpose built for difficult discussions about Canada's past. Late singer Gore Downey established the fund to foster cross cultural education and healing after learning Chani Wenjack's story. A lot of changes happened in from the 50s to the 60s, 70s. Djibouti Alika Taktak tells the group about Inuit culture before the Europeans arrived. In this way, an Inuit culture and life, there is family sharing, culture sharing, food sharing. Everything was based on sharing with Inuit. The reality is that it is. It is. Whether we talk about it or not talk about it. Charlene Bearhead is co-chair of the Downey Wenchak Fund. She is also an educator on residential schools where Indigenous children were taken from their homes and forced into Christian boarding schools by the government. Many children were abused and at least 3,000 died before the last school closed in 1996. There's an ignorance that's shared by thousands and thousands and thousands of Canadians, and not because people are terrible people, but because they don't know. But we need to acknowledge the truth. But I also often wonder when people get defensive and start talking about, well, they meant well. Well, the most damning information you can get about how well the government meant is in their own documentation. Author Aviak Johnston is a youth ambassador on this leg of the expedition. She knows that scars from Canada's past persist. What do you think when people say that? They're like, you know, the past is a past, just get over it. Well, uh, we have memorials for all the wars. We have memorials for 9-11. We have memorials for so many things that affect our non-Indigenous societies, our settler society. But we have to struggle to get our history acknowledged. We're told to get over it, but like you guys aren't over your tra tragedies. Why do we have to get over ours? I know Canada has done horrible things to indigenous people. I would never support that type of just horrible treatment. But also Inuit, especially in Nunavut, I find a lot of Inuit are very proud to be Canadian. And I'm proud when I say I'm Canadian. Why come on this trip, this journey, if you've been to these places before? Mm. I find uh, I'm so proud to be from Nunavut. I'm born and raised from Baffin Island kind of girl. <laughs> so you feel like you're coming home? Yeah, yeah, it does feel like that. <laughs> the distant, sheltered beauty. It's hard to not be moved by it immediately. Of the untamed far north. The land is what defines us people. When W5 continues. Over 13 days sailing above the Arctic Circle, the Canada C3 participants have seen things up close that Canadians outside of the North never will. In Joe Haven, Nunavut, the day starts with a hike. You can take your group on the walk now if you want. Just follow the red jacket. With a population of about 1,400, it's a major centre in the North. Youth Ambassador Marta Thorpe grew up just outside Toronto. She's struck by the small town welcome. What's the first thing that sort of stood out for you when we stepped foot on the shore? the sense of community. I feel like there was... It hits you right away. Huh? Yeah. And I feel like it was apparent that everyone knew each other and everyone was excited to see us. And it was nice to have those connections between the participants and the people on shore. Joe Haven has been a stopping point for European Arctic expeditions for centuries and is the closest town to the Terror and Erebus ruins from the Franklin expedition. Locals work with Parks Canada staff like Tamara Tarasov to safeguard the integrity of the sites. The wrecks of HMS Erebus and HMS Terror National Historic Site. 
It's the first National Historic Site managed by Parks Canada in Nunavut. Despite widespread searches by British and Canadian teams, the wrecks were lost for 170 years. Parks Canada finally discovered the wreckage of one of the ships, the Erebus, in 2014. Inuit oral history contained detailed information about the location of both Franklin ships. Inuk fisherman Sammy Kogvik helped locate the second ship, the Terror, in 2016. The discovery is one of the most important archaeological finds in Canadian history. Because of its proximity to the Franklin Ruins and Northwest Passage, visits to Joe Haven by tourists are increasingly common. But the people here have also kept a connection to tradition. Hunting and carving are popular. Two of Nunavut's most celebrated artists, Wayne Pukiak and his father, Urias, call Joe Haven home. Marta is surprised by how this town and this expedition have affected her. I definitely came thinking that environment would be the biggest impact on me, just having worked in, in the north and loving the environment so much. But I think the link between diversity and inclusion and the reconciliation themes have been a lot stronger. Um, of an impact on me than I had anticipated. And the connection between them completely surprised me. Do you think especially for you because you are a person of mixed heritage, or do you think that has been true of, of everybody, that that has been the dominant theme? Um, I think reconciliation has really been the dominant theme just because we're immersed in this culture and this landscape, and it's hard to not be moved by it immediately. Joe Haven residents make sure that C3 participants experience every aspect of their culture. They throw a party for their guests, complete with a drum dance. And a lively Inuit square dance. Square dancing was brought here by European explorers, but Inuit square dancing has thrived for more than a hundred years. The second last day on the ship is spent taking in as much of the environment as possible, paddle boarding and kayaking these northern waters. And one last party where Jenna, Uluriak Amarulik, and her sister Valerie teach the group about throat singing. <laughs> Even getting francophone singer Annie Cange to join in. <laughs> and then the C3 arrives in its final destination for this leg, Cambridge Bay. It's the future home of the Canadian High Arctic Research Station, or CHARS, set to open in a few months. Dr. David Scott is head of Polar Knowledge Canada, the government agency in charge of CHARS, and he sees its mission as an urgent one. The Arctic is changing in so many ways, socially, economically, and of course environmentally, and we just don't have enough information to really fully understand how it's changing and how we can begin to prepare for the changes we might be able to predict better if we understood the natural systems a little bit better. When it comes to climate change, how, how dire is the situation? Well, I think folks around the world are realizing it's happening. In this cold environment where you know, the ground is permanently frozen most of the year, um, as things warm up, the changes are even more dramatic. So this is the front line in the battle against climate change? I think that's a fair statement. Uh, you know, although most Canadians um, never seem to have the opportunity to come to the north, there are Canadians, most of whom are Indigenous, who live here year-round. Uh, and they expect the same sort of quality of life that uh, Canadians across the country do. But when their environment is changing more dramatically than the rest of the country, uh, it makes it difficult to, to plant infrastructure in communities and support things. How much of this facility going up 
do you think is part of Canada's plan to solidify sovereignty in the North? When we invite uh, researchers from other countries, they follow our rules and regulations. And that is the ultimate expression that the world recognizes that Canada has d dominion or sovereignty over these, uh, over these lands here in the northern part of our country. The world recognizes that when we invite them to come and follow our rules. Cambridge Bay is not yet a research hub, but it has attracted outside interest thanks to melting roots that make leisure journeys possible. Four cruise ships visit the hamlet in just six days. The 175-passenger Bremen and luxury vessel, the Crystal Serenity, coincide with the C3 stop. The Crystal Serenity is only in its second year sailing the Arctic. The floating village boasts more than 1,700 passengers and crew, more than Cambridge Bay's entire population. Tickets for these cruises start at $25,000. The annual income in Cambridge Bay is $28,000 per person. On the last night aboard the C3, Jenna has mixed feelings about sharing her home with outsiders. She has seen massive changes in the last two decades. What most worries you about, about the North moving, moving forward? The ice, I think, is one that worries me the most. It's funny how like when it's all frozen over, you can travel on it and it connects everything that way. And at the same time, economically, that's definitely very beneficial. However, for the environment, it's not a good thing. So if it were up to you, what would you do? Would you just cut it off, cut tourism off? I would try to look for a balance, but when money comes into play, it's very hard to manage and it's very hard to stop it. So I know um, even if I wanted to say don't come here, but at the same time we Inuit are very welcoming people, I can't just say don't come here. I can only say please respectfully come here. Do your best not to waste anything. Don't, don't put too much of your footprint on, on the land. We have our own um, culture where we don't own land. We cannot make borders. We, we can't define land. The land is what defines us people. For example, if I were to live out on the land all by myself, I probably wouldn't survive on my own in this land. So why am I trying to control it when it really controls my fate? So how do you hope 150 years from now things will look different than the past 150 years? Well, I hope that um, when I walk down in either Ottawa or Toronto or Vancouver, I won't be looked at like I'm different. I hope that they'll smile at me like they smile at the people that they see down south. Canada C3 founder Jeff Green has a similar vision for the kind of country he hopes to create. Uh, if we dream big, if we, th if we think long term, let's not worry about what we can do next week or a year from now. What can we do now that's going to have an impact 25 years from now, 50 years from now, in our children's lifetimes? Um, that's the type of thinking I think we really need. And, and this generation of youth in particular, I think it's a really exciting time. And we need to instill that in them. By the way, if you've been wondering what C3 stands for, it's Canada's three coastlines. And the Arctic is longer than either the Pacific or the Atlantic. We'll be right back.